to, if we're talking about the union of, of uh, Russian workers or just Russian and Yiddish and Jewish anarchism generally, I mean, in smaller towns and smaller cities in, in the US, what did that activism and organization and culture look like a little more specifically? Uh, the second question is I'm curious what kinds of ties and connections uh, Russian and uh, Yiddish anarchists had outside of you know Europe and Russia and uh, the United States say you know across uh, South America Latin America Mexico and you know Asia where there were there anarchist movements if those connections existed and if so what you know what did that look like well just to say a little bit more about the Union of Russian workers and, and how it worked um, <clears throat> so it was a federation with something like 30, 40, 50 branches. And they had branches not only in New York and, and Pittsburgh, uh, big cities, but in small towns throughout the, the region as well. I mean, I don't know how this applies for today, but just, just to give you a little bit more of the background. So um, there was, they were always trying to respond to the needs of the local community. So there are URW branches all around, small towns. And, and in order to sort of um, coordinate the organizing, there would be speakers the headquarters was in New York, and they would send organizers and speakers out to these small towns, some of the more talented speakers to, to help with the organization, people who had experience, and to get the organization off the ground that way. Um, but it was basically, it was a, you know, it was a labor and it was a social organization. So they would, even in small towns, they would provide, try to provide uh, resources for Russians, like, you know, job information, basic, creating um, basic social spaces for people to come and listen to lectures. They had these they call them Russian people's houses where people would come and sort of create a community and create a culture for Russians to come and participate in. So in order to get them involved in, in labor organizing and into anarchism, they welcomed all Russians and they wanted people to, um, you know, to, to attend their parties. They had parties all the time and they went to um, you know, all these events where they'd take trips, cultural trips, and, um, and basically just trying to <clears throat> bring the Russian community together in the United States. That was a, that's a, you know one of the one of the most important functions that it has in terms of how that can translate today. I, I, um. Um, I would say in this question about small towns, it's it's a great question. Um, basically, when it comes to anarchism, these were immigrant movements, right? And so they were successful wherever immigrants were. And oftentimes we think of them usually in these ethnic enclaves in the cities, but there were lots of immigrants in the countryside, right? Also sometimes in ethnic enclaves, but in towns. Um, Kenyon's book, Immigrants Against the State, is, is about Jews and about uh, Italians. The Jewish section is mostly about New York, uh, and the Italians is largely about Patterson, New Jersey, which of course is just across the river, uh, and is really great. And if you're interested in, uh, in that, I would follow that thread. Um, it is also something that, you know, the idea now that we have now that rural areas are generally more right-wing and, and urban areas are generally more left-wing is, is not that old of a distinction and right in so the 19th century people might have thought the opposite right that the sort of uh, liberal and conservative intellectuals who were opposing anarchism would have been in the uh, urban centers uh, and they were really desperately trying to keep anarchists out of the mines for instance because they knew that it's as soon as they enter that people are going to start to radicalize right so it seemed like the countryside was a basically a political place that was waiting to be politicized um, so it was a, a struggle in that way and you could say that it's the same in a certain way now um, and about your question about the sort of connections between Jewish anarchists and Russian anarchists around the world, there are connections all over the world. The, the biggest center outside of the U.S. is probably Buenos Aires, um, but there are connections really all over. Anywhere the Jews were, they formed Yiddish anarchist groups in South Africa, in, in Israel, in Australia, and there were connections wherever basically those other immigrants went as well. Um, you would even see interesting connections, uh, say in California, between Jewish and Japanese um, anarchists, and I even found it's really depressing to look at the uh, like collections of Jewish anarchists from the 70s because it's like they, they have so little money they're writing on the back of sandwich receipts and stuff. Um, but there is a letter from a Japanese anarchist organization in like 1969 writing to Hefrea Abershtima saying, um, We've never heard of you before, uh, what are you? And uh, they respond, like, Well, you know, we're this group, this is our long history, blah, blah, blah. We're so glad to hear that there are comrades in Japan. And actually, they had had contact before. It just neither group now remembered it. Um, so it's interesting to see how those connections fell apart. Let's take two more questions, sir. Uh, 
Hi, uh, great presentation by all three of you. And uh, there's something you touched on, I think all of you touched on, even some of the uh, people on the previous panel touched on, which was the, the pogroms and the effect that that had on radical organizing. Uh, and I think this is really relevant today because I think that the Black Hundred and those movements are the real precursors of, of um, the alt-right, um, even more so in a way than the SA and so forth. That they, the pattern really started there. So my question is this, um, to what extent did the outbreak of the, the outbreak of the, the programs as a real phenomenon happening in, 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 in sort of in, in, in really large scale uh, to what extent could that be said to have um, encouraged radicals to go more in the direction of socialism or the Bund, let's say, in the case of, of uh, Yiddish-speaking people, as opposed to anarchism? Did it, did it have an effect in terms of saying this is more, and if, more if, if we want to combat this, this is a more effective way of organizing or a more effective ideology to take on than anarchism? Or is it maybe the other way around? I mean, who on the left, I mean, to, I, I know it's a bad word, benefited in terms of being able to organize because of these events? Uh, I would say that they both benefit, and they both benefited greatly. And you can see basically the, the history of modern Jewish political movements, uh, the birth of modern Jewish political movements uh, has a large part to do with the waves of pogroms. Uh, so in the 1880s, uh, there's major pogroms between 1881 and 1884, and it leads to basically the, the birth of um, uh, all modern Jewish political movements, uh, political movements, um, uh, but they're still relatively unpopular. Uh, and then in 1903, you see Kishina Pogrom, and then there's another boom in Jewish political movements, and now they're starting to find ways to negotiate with working class Jews. Before, for instance, um, anarchists and socialists, uh, both in the U.S. and Russia, were mostly um, operating in Russian because they were from assimilated petty bourgeois backgrounds, and they didn't necessarily speak Yiddish. And they were really annoyed that basically Jewish workers wouldn't listen to them because there wasn't that much connection between them. Uh, and they were also kind of talking about the wrong things. And then after the pogroms, they start to switch into Yiddish. Uh, and then there's this explosive growth. And then after 1905, there's another growth. And then after uh, 1917. So it keeps really growing in response to violence. But I wouldn't say it's necessarily a push towards socialism or anarchism or even the left. It's a push towards nationalism. Um, not necessarily articulated as nationalism. It, it would be difficult to call the Bund a nationalist group. But in many ways, it, it's using nationalist language. It's using goals that are normally associated with nationalism. Um, and there's also, I, didn't, I had to cut this out of the lecture, but um, there, uh, after the Kishinev pogrom, a certain uh, sect of theorists of the Yiddish anarchists in the US um, break off and they formulate what they call, what they call for uh, Yiddish uh, nationalist anarchism, uh, which beforehand seemed like a total contradiction. Uh, and then it, it never takes off, but it does start a newspaper. Um, and it does actually, I think, really warp the Yiddish mainstream anarchist movement because it has to start responding to nationalism and start taking on nationalist tools, whether it wanted to or not. So, yeah. Nina, Mark? Maybe just a, two words because, you know, it sounds, um, I hope I'm mistaken, but, um, you know, in, in the way you're forming your question that, uh, you know, the certain radical acts uh, committed by anarchists, right, uh, was provoking oppression and therefore the falling population. Am I correct or not? No, no, okay, no that's, that's not what I was saying. Yeah, because, I, 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 because you know, the thing is that um, let's not confuse the whole anarchist movement with anarcho-terrorism. That's something very, very different. Also, don't forget that any terrorist act uh, always is used and abused by both sides, right, as a pl propeller to extremism. And I mean extremism not just from the political group, but from the government, most of all. Therefore, a lot of such terrorist acts in the history, in past, present, and I'm sure in the future, are actually a provocation. Or if they're not provocation, just accidents, they played that or this way. And anarchists were always kind of like caught in between. Because, uh, you know, in this, in this respect, anarchists like Jews, <laughs> they're first to blame for anything what is happening. Blame on both sides, you know, <laughs> left and right. 
that just can I to just put it mildly. I mean, you say that there were no explicitly anarchist groups in Russia until 1904, and a lot of them were read explicitly anarchist, according to Average. Okay. <laughs> and uh, well, <laughs> right, but they were. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Well, let's just say that. <clears throat> They really started to grow as a movement during during the course of like 1903, 1904. It became it really kind of became a big movement. Uh, surrounding the building. Nina, okay. use your mic. Use your mic. No, I, 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 but my my point was simply that <laughs> my point is that I, I do think that, that it sort of uh, spurred the growth of the anarchist movement as a result. They were led by a lot of Russian Russian Jews, and I do think that the, that the programs helped in the sense that to answer your question, uh, the growth of, of the anarchist movement. Radicalize, radicalize these people, right? If your uncle's your uncle's killed, you're gonna you're gonna take on the kind of mainstream doctrine. Okay, uh, you know, Paul Alvarez writes about three waves of anarchism movement in Russia, 1880s, which is uh, directly related with what was called Narodovolzhye, right? Populists, uh, Kropotkin, Bakunin, uh, who you know were meeting with. Uh, you know, French uh, anarchists at the time, and et cetera, et cetera, it was all brought to Russia. Then, uh, you know, um, after the uh, assassinations of, you know, Tsars and et cetera, et cetera, the anarchist movement was, would be kept on the lead, would kind of migrate to immigration, et cetera, et cetera, but continued to exist. And there would be the next wave, it was right, uh, you know, as Mark said, he's absolutely correct, right around the, you know, 1905 revolution, kind of like the pre, uh, in wait, uh, preliminary to 1905 revolution, and they actually very much connected to cultural movements and uh, intelligence and a particular symbolism, such as mystical anarchists, et cetera, et cetera. After that, again, banned till 1917. But, you know, it, it never stopped. And the influence, actually, of the, of the anarchist philosophy and theory, you not know, just, you know, small, tactics of political groups of killing here and there. I mean, killing is not the purpose of anarchism. The purpose of anarchism is freedom and creativity. Um, if I can just add a couple words, because uh, a couple people asked me about this point too, about the connection between Jewish anarchism and Jewish terrorism. I, I wouldn't go so far away to separate them as different things. I think um, violent terrorism is part of the history of anarchism, among many other things. For most of anarchism's history and most of its existence, it has not been violent, but we shouldn't necessarily eschew the parts that have been violent. There have been uh, anarchist Jewish terrorists in the US. They were just all very bad terrorists. Um, so uh, for instance, uh, Alexander Berkman shoots Henry Clay Frick and stabs him, does not kill him, ends up in prison. He later, um, Emma Goldman you know, writes a very sad letter after Alex Berkman uh, dies. Uh, because he'd been dying of cancer in France, and he um, tried to shoot himself, and he missed again. And uh, he... closer to the mic. Sorry. Closer. Oh, sorry. And uh, and so and then he he died very slowly and painfully. There were other um, Sally Feinstein. I'm not going to remember the names, and the names aren't so important. But there are a couple um, anarchist Jews around the turn of the century. It's not clear what their affiliations are, but they uh, identified as anarchists who tried to throw bombs and killed themselves or the bombs don't work, or there are bombs that are found, you know. It, so it's difficult to dissociate these things completely. It, it is part of the history. Uh, yeah, can you make it short? Okay. As they should. So the pogroms, they also led to the renaissance of uh, modern Hebrew poetry. Uh, Balik, for instance. So here's my question. Uh, you never, n nobody mentioned here. What was the relationship between anarchists and Zionists, both left and right wing. <laughs> Very good question. I don't know the answer. I want to hear that. There is uh, still a lot to be done there. There are some people working on this. Um, so there are several answers that I'll give in brief because I don't want to take up too, 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 too much time. Um, there are lots of anarchists. Few anarchists die as anarchists. Um, they often end up evolving into some other form of movement, some other type of uh, person. So uh, there are 
after Kishinev, after 1905, after 1917, after other events, anarchists have become Zionists. Uh, sometimes they go back too, it's, they have complicated histories. Um, and they bring a lot of real radicalism into the history of Zionism. Uh, a lot of people kind of forget the history of, of radicalism that has gone into the history of Zionism because it's, it's quite erased today, but uh, anarchism has a real component there, at least an influence. And then there are people like Abba Gordon uh, writing uh, in Israel and, and other people, he's, he's the most famous, who are trying this weird synthesis between anarchism uh, and Zionism. It might be so unrecognizable that it's hard to call it Zionism in the way that we think of Zionism today, but it is there, it was attempted, uh, and it has a similar history to the connections between anarchism and, and Judaism. Um, and sort of it begins as a total retaliation against each other, but then there are some sort of cohesive things that form. But the, I, I wouldn't say they're hugely influential. They were never the mainstream. Uh, but I think other people will talk about this. So. Thank you so much. What a lively, interesting <laughs> panel. Um, ten minute break. We're going to start at four o'clock for the next panel. Ten minutes. Thanks. Do you have a reimbursement? Yeah. 
enjoy the rest of the Yeah, yeah. 
Hi, everybody. Um, please take your seats <clears throat> and so we can get started with the, um, with the third panel. Uh, those of you who are in the Great Hall, there are plenty of seats in the auditorium. Uh, so please do come in if you wish. I uh, will get started in one second. Thanks very much. <clears throat> 